You're watching KHQA Overtime with Chris Dewar. Brought to you by Con Communications. And this is Saturday, September the 22nd, and you have entered Overtime, where we deliver local sports so fast you'll freak. And tonight, this is the hero sandwich of highlight shows. Layer upon endless layer of football goodness stacked to the sky, balanced nicely with a sumptuous spread of volleyball and softball offerings to boot. But we're going to begin just a little bit differently tonight. On Friday night, the Quincy Notre Dame football team successfully waged its second miracle comeback in as many weeks, rallying to beat Peoria High 33-29 in the final seconds. But apparently this cardiac kids phenomenon isn't merely limited to the gridiron. We take you to Jacksonville today, soccer, and look, it's Taylor Reese back. Hadn't played all season with that bad back. He was back today. His team, though, would find itself trailing right here early in the second half as look at the flick by Nick Hamilton on angle against the wind. Jacksonville up one to nothing. Remember Jacksonville lost to Q and D two to one last year. The Crimson's looking for revenge and David Elbers and goal was going to do everything in his power for Jacksonville to make that happen. Three spectacular saves in the stands are right there, but with 10 minutes left, this is Cooper Reese controversy. Number one indirect free kick. Does this ball touch Elbers hands? Couldn't tell from replay. Jacksonville coaches argued it did not. The goal was allowed. We, my friends, have ourselves a 1-1 game. 70 seconds left. More to come. More controversy as well. Parker Reese looks like he pushes off right there. No call either direction. Reese is going to center the ball to Taylor Reese. Again, first game back. Kicks it over here to Cooper Reese. It's a Reese to Reese to Reese sandwich. And Cooper's going to punch home the game-winning goal. Jacksonville coaches were furious over the contact. The no call on their own field. But to no avail for them, Quincy Notre Dame with a miracle comeback today. Day. They end up winning two to one, scoring the golden goal with 70 seconds left. As I mentioned, Q and D finds a little momentum, gets healthy. Young Master Riggs back as well, and Quincy Notre Dame looks really, really good. As you see, Cooper Reese punch home the game winner with the left foot there. Fun stuff for the Raiders today. Meanwhile, Quincy High goes on the road today and beats up on Alleman. Four to nothing was your final. Bronson Melvin with a pair of goals for the victors on this day. Well, in a full disclosure now, there's probably no high school football game on the regular season schedule that we've anticipated more than this week's first ever WIVC showdown between Concord Triopia and Central Southeastern. Both teams undefeated as of this week, both state ranked in their respective classes. But before we could start feeding the hype fire, which we're going to do all week long, the Trojans did have one last order of business with which to attend. Minden Unity on homecoming. Oh, Trojans all season long honoring Pam Crawford Shoney, who passed away of cancer. She is the mother of a couple of different Trojan players. Early on, Triopia there with a great start defensively. Jordan Smith, the big super sophomore, all 290 pounds of him, setting the tone with defense. And then Derek Shoney, the All-State candidate, books it to the outside. 18 yards for the score right there. Made it 8 to nothing after the PAT. More to come from Derek Shoney. Look at him cutting back right here. 20 yard pickup as the Trojan offense was geared up. This on its third possession, already leading 8 to nothing. The kids going bananas, and as well they should. More fun right here. This time it's the big fella, the sophomore, Matt Parker, who's done such a nice job at fullback. Big 25 yard pickup for him. That would set the table for this. Six yard Tanner Huddleston keeper. Don't look at Huddleston. Look at big number 58, Blake Richardson out in front. Take him to IHOP, pour it with syrup, because that, my friends, is a pancake. Good stuff right there. More to come. The double give right here for Triopia. That's Cody Curry taking it, oh, all the way down into the red zone. Sets up another Tanner Huddleston one-yard plunge. He had two of those on the day. Triopia built a 28 to nothing lead at the half. Never looked back and tuned up for Central Southeastern in major, major fashion. Winning today by the final count of 50 to nothing. The Trojans kids are very, very much for real. Meanwhile, just up the road at ISD, Brown County fans get a little antsy because their team was in the midst of a three-game losing streak. ISD trying to make something happen right here. With a punt, maybe push Brown County in deep distance. That ain't going to work. Brady Long handing off right here on the old give. That's Braxton Phelps, and he's going to kind of knife his way back and forth through. He was probably one broken play right there from getting into the end zone. That would set up this, though. The touchdown rumble for Brady Long of six yards made it seven to nothing, just like that for the Hornets. More to come offensively. This time it's Adam Beef going in from short yardage, plunging in from two. The PAT would fail. It's 13 to nothing, Brown County. This should have counted. Unfortunately, it did not. Michael Scoggin with the interception and the pick six 
There was a clipping call on the other side of the field that had nothing to do with the run back. Michael Scoggin robbed of his glory moment. No matter. Just a few minutes later, it's Nathan McDera going in for the score. Brown County jumps all over today for the first three quarters. All over ISD ends up winning by the final count in this one of 47-24 to get off the schneid. Now let's recap some of the Friday fun we had. Quincy High School taking on Rock Island Alleman. We don't have much to show you because there really wasn't much from the Blue Devil offense last night. These highlights pretty much indicative of the way things went. 134 yards of total offense, and as we told you last night, no Malik Robbins. Quincy High could just not get any kind of sustained offensive attack going. The Blue Devils lose last night 35-7. to Meanwhile, we'll take you to Sacred Heart Griffin. Bad news right here. Bryce Schnicker, who'd played so well at quarterback for Jacksonville, all season long, left with a broken ankle. We now know Mark Rounds told us that this morning. Jacksonville, a couple of different times, had chances to try and get into this game. Mm -hmm. Trying to punch things in just wouldn't work here. Next Jacksonville possession, Andy Mills in at quarterback. His first pass of the night intercepted right here by the outstanding Nate Lois, who takes that away. Ensuing Sacred Heart Griffin possession. It's Gabe Green hooking up right here with Chris Harris for the first down. Oh, SHG not done yet. Playing in that magnificent new complex of theirs. How about the option keeper? Oh, no, this is Harris right here, nearly untouched with a really long run to make it 14 to nothing. Then it is the quarterback, Gabe Green, going to do it all on his own. And again, nobody in the middle of that Jacksonville defense is going to get to him at this point. My friends, that makes it 21 to nothing. Mark Rounds makes the decision to go with the sophomore quarterback, then Zach Lonergan. And I tell you what, the kid showed a lot of scrappiness thrown right to the fire. This kid can play. Younger brother of Nick Lonergan, the Quincy University quarterback, slings it right here, completes his first pass of the night to Blake Hance. Said right away he felt good after that first pass. Then he's going to find Dalton Keene right here for the touchdown. Makes it 21 to 6. Tell you what, a magnificent night by the Jacksonville defense, albeit in a losing cause in this one. Uh, Jacksonville trying to make something right ha happen right here. This is uh, Adam Mills. He's just going to get absolutely plowed right here by that really good Sacred Heart defense. That on fourth and two. First down, though, at that point. Later in the drive, fourth and six. Zach Lonergan again looking to scramble. He gets blasted out of bounds by John Bells. And Jacksonville turns the ball back over on downs at that point. Jacksonville's defense, as I said, stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with a SHG. There was some talk. The Crimson's might be soft defensively. Look at Mr. Aaron Vasquez. There's nothing soft about that. Big hit on the night. Unfortunately, Jacksonville just couldn't get their offense going. Battle of State ranked teams goes to SHG last night in a thriller. 21 to 6. Great second half of the Jacksonville defense. Again, the Bryce Schnitger injury looms large, but Mark Brown says his team's just going to roll with it. Nothing changes, and they've got a lot of faith in uh, Zach Lonergan moving forward. Let's take you to the Missouri side of things now. Centralia trying to extend their Clarence Cannon Conference win streak to 69 last night, taking on Brookfield, who was undefeated coming in. Jesse Arnold, Blair Thal, they can play a little defense in this one, and you see why right there. Then it's Jesse Arnold breaking away from everybody. Maybe the fastest set of linebackers in the area. Jesse Arnold, not only a linebacker, he runs well in the backfield as well. Big run for him. Then it's the quarterback, Zach Etzler, to Chandler Blackwell, who's quietly having a great season for the Panther. That's a big game which sets up a Nate Van Boeing touchdown right here. All Centralia last night in surprisingly easy fashion as the Panthers knock off and destroy Brookfield 31 to nothing. Maybe the last threat to beat Centralia this season, Clark County coming up in a couple of weeks. I think that's two weeks away. We also had highlights last night from North Shelby trying to get off that 30 game losing streak, taking on Scotland County, two winless teams last night. Lots of defense in this one. North Shelby and Scotland playing tough right here. Tyler Kirby finding some running room to the outside, but these teams finished tied up at nothing at the half. How about Scotland County trying to make some things happen with their offense in this one? Chris Jackson would catch the short pass here from Cordy Kiger. Winds up taking eight North Shelby Raiders with him at one point all the way to the out of bounds lines. There's a kid who's showing some moxie. That would set up just a bit later. Will McRobert who had himself a monster night rushing wise. 182 yards rushing for Will McRobert. He doesn't even need the S on the back of his name. He's that tough. Will McRobert with a nice run there. That sets up Cordy Kiger with the only touchdown of the night. He comes on the keeper right here, and Scotland County gets off the schneid. They win. North Shelby's losing streak continues. 6 to nothing was your final last night. Hey, we're just getting warmed up here on the big show, and we're just getting warmed up for the week because you can vote on our Facebook page right now. 
If you don't know where it's at, just go to Doerisms. There's a link to it right there. You can vote for the Star of the Week. You vote. We honor the Star of the Week with a nice column on Thursday when Doerisms comes out. Right now, the voting is already going. It's fast and furious. And Dylan Parrish, who was edged out for the honor last week, is currently leading the Palmyra fullback, who had a couple of nice touchdowns last night, leading a couple of South Shelby Cardinals. Trace Windsor had a big night rushing-wise, and Wes Mefford, who returned from injury, looked real good. So South Shelby's 2-3 and three right now. Coy Dorothy, the outstanding West Hancock quarterback currently running in fourth, but you have all the way until Wednesday night at 8 o'clock to make a difference to vote for your candidate of choice. We hope you'll do so. Again, you can find the point of access at Doerisms right now at ConnectTriStates.com. And when we come back, we peruse the college football landscape, update you on all things Luke Guthrie, and offer up a look at all the day's diamond and volleyball offers. You're watching KHQA Overtime with Chris Dewar. Brought to you by Con Communications. Welcome back to Overtime and welcome to another weekend of Luke Guthrie making mincemeat of the web.com tour money list. He's again positioned himself nicely as the Quincy native firing a five under par 67 today. He's currently 11 under overall, which ties him for fifth place, puts him right back at the top of the leaderboard after a slow start to this tournament. He now trails Danny Lee, your leader by five strokes. I think Luke tees off tomorrow at about 1230. I don't believe there's any television coverage, so we'll keep you apprised of his progress right here tomorrow night. Let us talk some college football. Let us start with Tom Padgett getting real flirty today on the road with win number one as Quincy University appeared poised to pull off the upset of Urbana today. The Hawks leading until late in this game, and then it just went awry late for them. Great game from Dan Camp, the Rochester native, moved back to free safety this year. He had nine tackles, a sack, and two tackles for loss, but Quincy University still winless on the season. Western Illinois homecoming today at Hanson Field. Mark Hendrickson's team opening up with a real dandy of a test. That is ISU. Scoreless early on. WIU stuffing a third and goal for ISU at that point, but Western was flagged for running into the kicker on the field goal attempt. ISU gets new life, and that means Daryl and Dunn is going to go in for the score. Boy, that was pretty from him right there. That made it 7 to nothing. Later, how about Western Illinois' defense standing tall against that high-powered Redbird offense? Dwight Harris in the backfield for a tackle for loss. Then Theon Dixon made it tough on the Redbird running game with a tackle for loss as well. The defense did its part. Unfortunately, Western's offense just couldn't get on track today. Losing Max Dancer for the season last uh, week didn't help anything, and this didn't help anything either. 35-yard touchdown rumble from Daryl and Dunn. And you know what? Western's offense goes MIA today as ISU wins and spoils homecoming just a bit. 23-3 was your final there. How about we take you to the Hill in Canton where Jody Ford and Central Methodist were in town. Jody Ford, our old friend from Bowling Green. Lots of area ties right here. CMU looking to take a 10-0 lead early, but this field goal would go off the right post. However, CMU can kick field goals. More on that in a second. Culver looking to capitalize. Curtis Widener right here is going to roll out and find Kevin Chisholm wide open in this one for a really nice one-handed grab. And that's sensational seven-worthy right there, and that sets up this touchdown. Widener throws a teardrop to the back of the end zone. Mr. Ragsdale is there to catch it, and we're all tied up at seven apiece, and suddenly Culver Stockton's offense had come to life. CMU had other ideas. That's Logan Hicks, our old buddy from Hannibal, with a kickoff return. He wasn't the only local representing the pride of Clark County, Bobby Boucher himself. That would be Brian Plenge with a nice assist on the tackle right here for a Central Methodist. Nearing halftime, though, Central Methodist would go on a furious, furious run. It starts with a 55-yard field goal, and this couldn't have been more true. And the second half was pretty much all CMU as they wore out a very game and spirited effort from the Wildcats. Final count in this one, C Central Methodist win 32-7. at to seven. Culver Stockton still winless on the season. Illinois College Day at home taking on Rippon. Garrett Campbell's team looking to go to 3-0. and Somebody's winning college football games around here. Rippon would cut a 24-7 seven lead in the fourth quarter right here to 24 to 14 on the quarterback keeper. Michael Bates was having none of it. Boy, this offense is high octane wide open. That would set up this Dakota Lammy. He was fifth on the depth chart at tailback to open the season. Look at him go in from one yard right out there. His second touchdown of the ball game. He had 85 yards as well as Illinois College gets it done yet again today. Sorry for these short highlights ran out of tape and battery after a busy day in Jacksonville. As you saw, Big win for Illinois College. They're back home next week against Lawrence. Plenty of highlights for that one coming up for you next week. Also, some college scores to pass along today. Big news 
for Bushnell Prairie City Avon's own Trey Yoakum, who scored two touchdowns today, including the 33rd of his career. That makes our man Yoakum, if you got him, the all time career leader in touchdowns at Monmouth College, breaking a record that was 37 years old. Congratulations to Trey. Congratulations to Monmouth. Ace Hendricks, Trey Yoakum and company. Uh, they all get the win today, 31 to 28 over Cornell. Also on the docket today, we've got more for you. Let's talk some scores. Culver Stockton soccer. The women's team back off the schneid after a one game losing streak, if you will. Vanessa Hare with a pair of goals today as Culver improves the 6 1 and 1 on the season. A couple more for you. We've got volleyball, Quincy University, a loser to Drury in four games today, and the Western men's soccer team with a tie against Omaha to start conference play on the day. Hey, we've got more for you when we come back. Actually, I got big news right here. We want to tell you about some softball right here. Camp Point Central's junior high school team. Great, great chance today to go undefeated on the season and to win a state championship. They had to win two state semifinals today. Central beats Princeville three to nothing. Brianna Hildebrand with a triple and a couple RBIs in that one. The news so good. Central gets to 20 and 0. They cannot get to 21 and 0, however, as Central loses in the championship game to Buffalo Tri-City 4-2, but congratulations to those fine young ladies on a wonderful, fun, wonderful run as they get it done today. And we'll have more sports for you on the Big Overtime Show coming up next. Let's do us some softball right now. Take you to the Centralia Tournament today. Palmyra came in as the two seed, and the Panthers were getting it done behind Madison Rager. She was really good on the hill, preserving a 1-0 lead in the early game today against Hallsville. Then the offense finally kicked in when the Panthers woke up. Starts here with a sacrifice fly from Miss Jamie Martin. Scores Alexis Van Nostrand. It's 2-0 Palmyra after three innings. Bottom of the fourth. More to come. The onslaught begins. Lexi Lawson with a bunt that scores Brianna Caldwell. Three to nothing, Palmyra. We're not done. Same inning. Liz Stansberry singles to score Lawson and EB Miles. Palmyra up five to nothing. The big blast. How about the aforementioned Jamie Martin? Have a day, Miss Jamie. Going yard in this one. A three run jack makes it eight to nothing. All about Palmyra today as they get business done early and beat up on Hallsville by the final count in this one of 11 to nothing. They will also go on today to win the championship in a championship matchup that was a battle of the class two state champion and the class three state champion. Class two wins out. Palmyra beats Centralia and Bailey Douglas, D Douglas, I should say, 11 to 5 was your final there. Pretty impressive day for Brian Wassman's crew. Also today, Knox County improves to 14 and 1 on the season, beating up today on Schuyler County to win the Schuyler County Tournament. And Mark Twain would take second at the South Callaway Tournament. They lost to Fatima in the title game 4 to nothing, but they ended up uh, uh, beating, as you see right there, South Callaway 5-4 to four to get to that championship game. Well, speaking candidly, there are a few things in this job I enjoy less than having to sit through what seems to be an internally long volleyball warm-up session, an exercise that often seems to take longer than the game itself. That said, the Hannibal Lady Pirates may have found just the right way to spice the proceedings up. I saw this today, have never seen this before. This is freeze tag, and I kid you not, this is part of the pregame ritual. And I kid you not, I think Tessa Beenix skinned her knee playing it. But you know what? These Hannibal Lady Pirates are tough. This is a new session, and they would show it today against Bowling Green in the opening game today. Although the Lady Bobcats were trying to fashion an upset early in this game as Ella Clote comes up with the big kill right here early to force the side out. Hannibal, though, just plowed through the adversity right here. It's Melanie Blaze throwing down nice and hard, skying for the nifty finish. Then off the Tessa Beenick serve, Brooke Watson is going to punish the Bobcats for being bad at this point in serve receive. Just a little pat down at that point. She tamps it down nicely as well. Then it's Gabby Wiley serving and Catherine Allen, who's going to make her presence felt. Hannibal looked really good in the early going today, just kind of dominating in game number one, 25 to 13. They're also going to win game number two, 25 to 11, as you see Gabby Wiley with the service ace. Then Carly Watson with the beautiful setter dump coming right here. Hannibal making everything work for them today in this match. Oh, there you go. Setter dump as well, and maybe the prettiest spike of the week. I mean, courtesy of Kay Gieske as well as Hannibal wins in straight games 25 to 13 and 25 to 11. Hannibal would advance all the way to the championship game, end up taking second place on the day. More volleyball for you. Holy Trinity, a loser for the first time this season, albeit to the number one ranked team in Class 3A. Hannibal, or excuse me, Holy Trinity, I should say, the number two ranked team in Class A. That's the first loss of the season for the Lady Satyrs. Also moving on today, let's talk some cross country. Quincy Notre Dame finishing second at the Monmouth Invite to the host school. Luke Watson, though, your medalist today with the win on the girls' side. 
Macomb finished second on the day to the host school Monmouth. Karen Paisley was your medalist as well. Congratulations to both outstanding runners for another great showing. Well, tis this time every Saturday we honor the area's best sports coupling with the Con Communications Connection Award. Each week in the segment, we'll unveil our pick for the best local connection. The monthly award, however, is all up to you. You can go to our website during the last week of each month, which is next week for us, peruse the nominees and vote for your favorite. And as inducement to vote, we're offering each and every one of you a chance to win a great prize package from Con Communications simply by casting your vote. You gotta love democracy. Today, it's real easy. I'm gonna show some offensive lineman love because we love Blake Richardson throwing down right here. Best of the week, best pancake we've seen this season, and we're gonna slow it down for you. Blake Richardson bringing the noise. All-state caliber linebacker. He might be the same as an offensive lineman right here as it gets no prettier than this. Congratulations to Blake Richardson. If he is your vote of choice, cast it coming up next week for Blake Richardson. You have other nominees still to consider, however. Uh, you've got the great pass to Austin Hardy from Coy Dorothy, the great hit from Riverview of Quincy High School, and as we unveiled last week, the great soccer pass to beat Elias for the first time ever between Tyler Thomure and Aaron White. All good stuff. Please vote. And again, it's a great prize package. Con Communication will do you up, so we hope you'll vote next week.